người She stole my heart with the way she smiled And the way she talked Would drive me wild Down by the river Down by the old oak tree Sweet little angel of mine Brings out the devil in me As time went by Our love began to grow We'd count the days Until I had to go And then one morning I had to leave Now all that's left is a memory Down by the river And of the old oak tree Sweet little angel of mine Brings out the devil in me This way the first time I looked into your eyes I knew that it was love I knew you were the only one for me From now until forever With you I want to be with every night We'll start our life together So just give me your hand For now and forever And I give you my heart Forever and more For the rest of our days For now and forever with you Every 
every time I think of you I look into the future and I see The two of us together No matter what may come our way We will be standing side by side to see it through Cause I can't live without you Without an end, a day is way too long I need you here forever So just give me your hand For now and forever And I give you my heart Forever and more For the rest of our days For now and forever with you So just give me your hand For now and forever And I give you my heart Forever and more For the rest of our days For now and forever with you Good morning, dear friends. Please have a seat. There are lots of uh, seats up here, so please join us here in the front. Good morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Karin Olofsdotter. I am the Swedish ambassador uh, to the United States. And I'm very honored to see that so many of you have taken the time on a more gray morning uh, to come to our embassy to have interesting discussions on, on defense uh, matters. If you haven't been to House of Sweden before, uh, I will tell you in a non-Swedish way that we are extremely proud of this building. Uh, it's about 10 years old now and it has really put us on the map in Washington DC. We use the facility uh, for events like this, but also cultural events, music, uh, etc. So you are all welcome here on the weekends for the exhibits we put on show in this, this hall. But we also have a great uh, theme program uh, that you can access on our website. So I really hope to see you here for more non-serious events as well. Uh, Today, uh, today's event is part of a series uh, that we have during the year. Uh, we will actually kickstart it today. It's called Swedish Footprints. Uh, Swedish Footprints is about how do we tackle the future uh, and our past uh, in a link, one could say. We celebrate 200 years of diplomatic relations with the United States uh, this year. So we will both uh, look back. Uh, on our relationship over the year, years, and their uh, defense cooperation, of course, is a very important, long-standing cooperation that we've had. But also look at future issues that are on the political agenda, both in the United States and Sweden. Uh, and that's, for instance, the future of work, life, etc. So we really hope, as I said before, to welcome you back to uh, other events as well. 
So I'm extremely happy to welcome the Swedish Defence Commission here today. Uh, the Defence Commission is appointed by the Swedish government to prepare next year's defence uh, bill. And it's a group of parliamentarians comprising the eight uh, different parties that are represented in the Swedish parliament. So it's really across the aisle uh, group. They are visiting uh, Washington to, and New York, where they were before, to, to pick the brains of people like you uh, and other partners on, on where is the US going when it comes to defense and security and what could cooperation uh, look like in the future. So uh, they, of course, conduct their uh, analysis and discussions uh, against the background uh, of a rearming Russia and higher tensions in our region. Of course, the Russian aggression against uh, Georgia and the Ukraine is a challenge to the existing European security order, which is something we, of course, take extremely seriously. So uh, we must all ensure uh, that we are prepared to handle future consequences of conflict in our region and that we are sufficiently equipped to do that. So over the last years in Sweden, uh, we have increased our spending on defense, we have modernized our equipment and increased our training and exercise activities. We are also deepening our defense cooperation with NATO and bilaterally with our neighbors as well as with the United States. And at the same time, it has become clear to us that the preparedness of our civil society to meet the challenges of a conflict must be improved. We were just talking about uh, the bathtub here, the chairman of the commission and I. I remember when I was a child, you know, when we still had telephone books, the first pages were like, in case of crisis, fill your bathtub with water. And of course, as I was a child, I thought that sounded very disgusting. <laughs> and luckily, we never had to do it. Uh, but we had, a, uh, the civil society in that time had a more, I think, a, a greater awareness of, of what we as civilians must do in an event of crisis. So, um, the Commission has presented a report in December last year uh, on how do we do this in the future, how do we raise the awareness again uh, and the total concept of total defense uh, with the general public in Sweden. Sweden and the United States uh, has a long-standing close and fruitful cooperation uh, on civilian crisis management, actually. And the area of civil defense, uh, I am sure, uh, will present us with an equally interesting field of cooperation. So I am therefore extremely happy uh, to welcome this fine group of parliamentarians to, to Washington and to the House of Sweden as well as the rest of you. And it's with great anticipation I'm looking forward to uh, an extension of the friendship that we have between each other. And today's event we do in collaboration with the Atlantic Council, which is a very dear and important partner to uh, my embassy. So it's with great pleasure I welcome Magnus Nordemann. There you are. <laughs> Uh, of the Atlantic Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Ambassador, so much. And, and certainly the, the, the feeling is mutual uh, uh, when it comes to our cooperation with, uh, with the Swedish Embassy and, and the Swedish government. It's, it's always great to be, be at the House of Sweden. It's a, it, it's a great venue for, for these kind of um, 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 events. Um, so thanks again to, to the Embassy and House of Sweden for, for hosting this event and for, for the opportunity for, for the Atlantic Council to, to cooperate with the Embassy um, around it. Um, from an Atlantic Council perspective, um, uh, this seminar and, and the commission report that we're going to discuss today is, of course, um, extremely timely um, as it addresses a, a range of challenges that, that Sweden, uh, the transatlantic community, Europe, and the United States are, are facing today during a period of truly immense uh, turbulence and insecurity around the world. Um, and, and, and in that context, obviously, we also believe that it's especially important uh, to highlight the role of societal functions and, and resilience as a, as a key aspect of a whole of government approach to, uh, to, uh, to a crisis. Um, um, and also from an Atlantic Council perspective, this really brings together two of our core practices, if you will, or, or core themes, which is on the one hand, transatlantic security, but also, um, also our, our, uh, our growing work on, uh, uh, on, on societal, societal and governmental resilience. So this is, this is right in our, um, in our wheelhouse. 
Um, I will be moderating discussion um, um, after the after the remarks. Uh, very eager to to involve all of you all in the uh, in the discussion. To eager to hear your your thoughts and questions. Um, but we also have two great speakers with us today. First, Bjorn von Sydow, um, who's a member of Parliament and chairman of the Defence Commission, and a former Speaker of, of Parliament. And then Christine Wormuth, who's the director of the Resilience Centre at the Atlantic Council and a former Under Secretary of Defence for um, for policy in the in the Obama administration. So I think we'll have a we'll have a good discussion with with some really insightful Swedish and American perspectives um, uh, on these issues. Um, so first I will turn over to, to Björn to, to brief out the report and, and discuss the report and then Christine will follow. Björn, the, uh, the, uh, the podium is yours. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> as chairman of the Swedish Defence Commission, it's a great honour for me to speak in front of such a distinguished audience. I really appreciate all the hard work made by the embassy here in Washington in preparing the program for our visit and hosting this seminar. Uh, we arrived here by train from New York Tuesday and where in New York we had a very interesting meetings with the representatives of the United Nations structures. We will be here until Friday and we have an excellent program with a lot of meetings and seminars to look forward to. And this visit will provide us with important and valuable insights informing our coming work. Today, I will give you a briefing about the work of our commission focusing on our report Resilience, as was told. It's called the Total Defense Concept and the Development of Civil Defense 2021 to 2025. And I have some slides in order to support me. So I hope for next there. We'll see how it works out. Yeah, there we go. A few words additional to what the uh, ambassador told us. In order to clarify the strategic direction of a coming defense bill, which will cover that period 2021 to 2025, the government and the minister have appointed a new defense commission a year ago. We consist of 12 members of parliament's eight political parties, and we serve as a forum for consultations between the government and representatives of the political parliaments in, uh, in parliament. The aim, and I will stress this, is to achieve a broad political support regarding the future development of Sweden's security and defense policy. Our Commission's reports serve as important input to the government in the work leading up to a new defense bill. And as I told you, this, the new report, a year, only two months ago, it focuses on the future development of Sweden's total defense concept, putting particular emphasis on our so-called civil defense. First, some words about the concept total defense. According to Swedish law, total defense is defined as the preparations and planning required to prepare Sweden for war. If the government declares highest alert, all societal functions are defined as total defense. The total defense concepts consists of both military defense and civil defense, and therefore lays out a whole of society approach to security. Actually, it is an approach not that different from the principles of resist, resilience found in Article 3 in the NATO Treaty. In accordance, the parliament, government, governmental authorities, municipalities, private enterprises, voluntary defense organizations, as well as individuals, all are we part of the Swedish total defense. Up to the end of the Cold War, Sweden had a systematic and well-developed total defense concept encompassing all society. Arguably, Sweden was one of the most militarized states in the Western Europe in that sense. As a part of the Cold War peace dividend, 
Sweden ended most of its total defense planning for, uh, for raised alert or war. Instead, Sweden prioritized expeditionary capabilities and crisis management. Large part of the previous total defense were decommissioned, not least on the civilian side. For many years, there, was, there has been no systematic planning or preparations for a decision of raised alert or wartime conditions. Due to the deteriorating security situation, this type of total defense planning resumed with the new Defense Bill 2015. As a result, government authorities were assigned to once again start planning for wartime conditions. However, up until now, there has been limited strategic direction or defined uh, ambitions in these planning efforts. Present Swedish defense policy focuses on two parts. First, to upgrade national military capability, and second, to deepen cooperation with other nations and organizations. When it comes to upgrading our nat national military capability, Sweden is once again focusing on increasing the ability to resist and counter an armed attack against our territory. Last year, a decision was made to reactivate conscription. With the current defense bill, there has been a new trend in Swedish defense spending. The government has, for the first time in more than two decades, decided to increase defense spending up to 2020. We are building a security network of defense cooperation. Sweden has a special and long-standing relationship with Finland. We now plan for a joint actions in peacetime as well as in crisis or war, if we so decide. We also work closely with the Nordic and Baltic countries as well as with the US, the UK, Poland and Germany. We cooperate within the framework of the European Union and the United Nations. We are also privileged partners to NATO within the Enhanced Opportunities Programme. In our report, The Total Defense Concept and the Development of Civil Defense 2021 to 2025, the Defense Commission concludes that instability and unpredictability characterize the global security situation. Transformation may be both quick and disruptive. This makes it unusually hard to foresee what the future may be. Russia challenges the established security order and works deliberately to augment its great power status. Russia wants increased room for maneuver and less so for small states. The challenges, the rule-based, that challenges the rule-based international order. Sweden's position in the Russian challenge to the European security remains firm. The Commission notes in its report that an armed attack on Sweden cannot be excluded, nor can the use of military measures against Sweden or threats thereof. A security crisis of an, or an armed conflict in our neighborhood would inevitably also have an impact on Sweden. Given this analysis, the Defense Commission suggests measures to develop the total defense concept. This includes measures to meet an armed attack against Sweden, including acts of war on Swedish territory. By clarifying that an attack against Sweden will be costly, the total defense concept together with diplomacy, political and economic measures will deter an aggressor from attacking Sweden or exerting influence by military means. In the extreme situation, 
the total defense must have a credible war-fighting capability with both a military and a civil defense. In a severe security crisis, it is the assessment of our commission that it will take a relatively long time before the necessary decisions on international, civil and military support of Sweden have to be made. Meanwhile, Sweden must have the capability to defend itself and endure the hardship unaided. We also argue that Swedish society must prepare for three months of serious disturbances. Part of this time, there will also be war. In a situation of war, or when there is a risk of war, the total defense efforts will be focused on military defense. We underline the necessity of transforming society to manage warlike conditions, to mobilize society and the military and civil resources to strengthen the defense efforts. That will take up to a week. In mounting a credible defense, the willingness to defend the country and having support from the people in the defense efforts are key factors for success. Residents and decision makers alike must be aware of what wartime conditions require of them. Awareness is necessary to withstand the initial shock and resist of an attack. In the report, the Commission underlines that the individual has a responsibility in a crisis of war and suggests that each individual should have a preparedness to manage his or her basic provisions for a week without public support. So what are the, then the challenges we stand for in practical terms? Over the last decades, Sweden has, like many other countries, gone through a considerable societal change. For example, our society is dependent upon electricity, information technology, communications, transportation, fuel, and not least financial services. Public services that the government previously operated are now under private ownership. These changes are important preconditions when resuming Swedish to total defense planning. In the report, we present a number of suggestions that would strengthen the capability and perseverance of the total defense to meet an, uh, an armed attack or war on Swedish territory, as well as a hybrid situation. The suggestions will also strengthen crisis preparedness efforts in peacetime. Some of the areas and function covered in the, in the report are, and here is a, a long range of, of items. I will not necessarily read them all, but I will go into some examples from our report. We argue that securing necessary and reasonable access to food, potable water, energy, and pharmaceuticals is crucial for the total defense capability in a security crisis or war. Sweden has to secure access to critical resources. Priority has to be given to goods and services necessary for survival and for the basic functionality of society. In order to manage and diminish the hardships of civilians in case of an armed attack, the Commission deems that plans have to be prepared and resources committed in peacetime for civil defense, including shelters and plans for evacuation 
of particular areas in the country. We find that the capability of the Swedish healthcare system to transition from regular operations to caring for mass casualties needs to be strengthened considerably. In an armed attack, the supply of electricity will most likely be severely limited. Emergency power solutions in order to secure supply of electricity will be a very important measure. All in all, I think it's fair to say that the suggestions in our report amounts to a societal reform. The Commission notes that there is a need and opportunity to develop international cooperation regarding civil defence. The Commission recommends increased cooperation with the European Union and NATO in this field. Deep and bilateral co cooperation with Finland and Norway is also suggested. We recommend that the government further explore conditions for trilateral cooperation with Finland and Norway. Such a cooperation would strengthen preparedness in all three countries. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue our work. We have restarted it again. This year, the Defence Commission focused mainly on the future development of the military defence and on security policy. We will continue to work until May 2019. However, there will be a period of less work between summer and early autumn this year because we have national elections in September. Ladies and gentlemen, again, our Commission is happy to be here in Washington, D.C. This visit will provide us with new insights and thoughts of high relevance for our coming work. That concludes my briefing, and I give the floor to the moderator to... Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to share some American perspectives on the very important work of the Swedish Defense Commission. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased as the director of the Adrian Arch Center for Resilience to see the resilient theme be such a prominent part of the, of the report. I, I started my career uh, in national security working on transatlantic security issues and I've had many opportunities over the years to see the very close relationship that the United States has with Sweden, particularly in the area of security issues. Um, and I think it's terrific reflecting that close relationship that your Prime Minister will be meeting with President Trump in just a few short weeks. I think that shows just how important our relationship is. And I think it's a terrific time to be talking about these issues because not only has your commission put out its report, but we here in the United States have also recently released our national security strategy and then uh, just about a couple of weeks ago our new national defense strategy, which is addressing many of the same challenges and issues. So this is a timely moment to be having this discussion. As I was listening to the chairman make his presentation, I was struck by that old saying that, you know, everything old is new again. And when I came into the Pentagon in the early 90s, we were doing a lot of work with the countries that had emerged from the Warsaw Pact. We had just started the Partnership for Peace program. And one of the areas that was a very um, fruitful place to start conversations with countries like Poland, Hungary, for example, was in the area of civil defense. You know, that was sort of a, a good, workable place to start cooperation. And many of the issues that the Commission is looking at and the recommendations and activities that the Commission calls for are things that, you know, we actually were thinking in many ways more about in the past than we have in the, in the recent times. So it's, it's interesting to see how things come around again. Um, 
We in the United States are actually starting to think more seriously again about civil defense ourselves for a variety of reasons. I think one of those reasons is the fact that we are, are really grappling ourselves with a variety of natural disasters. You know, we had an incredible hurricane season in 2017, wildfires, mudslides, uh, and many of the kinds of preparations that um, are needed that the Commission is calling for are also ones that are appropriate for us here in the United States, even though the challenges may be a little bit different. And then I think, frankly, sadly, the other reason that we are starting to think more about this here in the United States is the concern that many Americans feel about the instability on the Korean Peninsula and the fact that the North Koreans are clearly uh, getting very close to having the capability to strike the United States with an ICBM. And that, you know, witnessed by the false alert in Hawaii not too long ago, that is causing Americans to start thinking about things like um, what to do in that situation in a way that we haven't had to do for a very long time. So again, you know, interesting to see how these strands are coming together. I couldn't agree more with the Commission's um, assessment of the security environment and its assessment that we are facing an unstable and unpredictable environment. That is absolutely right and sadly I don't see that changing for the better in the near future. I think the Commission is right to um, anticipate that an attack on Sweden could come as a precursor to a broader war in Europe potentially, or, or Sweden could face something a little bit murkier, more of a hybrid threat that, that could still be very substantial. So I think the Commission has, has uh, understood the strategic environment very effectively. And I think it's particularly useful that the Commission has made the assessment that it may take time for the international community to make decisions and to possibly come to the aid of Sweden and hence that need to have Sweden as a nation be prepared to go it alone, if you will, for three months and to have individuals in Sweden be prepared to go it alone for at least a week. That's, um, I think that's a good, practical, pragmatic starting point. Um, and certainly from my experience in government, I was in the uh, Obama administration for almost the entire two terms, and I saw firsthand that decision making can sometimes be much slower than we would like. Uh, and particularly when policymakers are facing complicated, murky geostrategic threats, um, that decision making can get slowed down even more. So I think your planning is just right, and uh, I think as um, as the report mentions, you know what used to be unthinkable is no longer unthinkable. Um, the kinds of threats I think that the commission is anticipating may well be unlikely, but that is not the same as unthinkable. And I think um, recent events in the last few years have made that very plain. And in the Defense Department, uh, where I've spent most of my career, we are trained that it's important to do prudent planning uh, and to look at capabilities and to plan accordingly. So I think the work that you're doing is very important. I grew up in the South, and we have a saying there that says, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, and I think this is very much along the lines of what you all are doing. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a, a couple of observations I have on the Commission's report. And one of the themes that I, that I saw running through the Commission's report is the need to instill what I would call a culture of preparedness in your public. And I see that, frankly, as the biggest challenge for what you all are trying to undertake. Uh, it can be very hard, particularly in this day and age, to get our publics to take these kinds of challenges seriously. It's been a very long time since you know, the, the Swedes or the Americans have had to think seriously about this. I grew up uh, in the 70s and 80s during the Cold War, and we would occasionally do a drill. You know, I look back, I remember uh, in elementary school, we would do nuclear drills where we would get under our desks. And looking back on that, I think, for heaven's sakes, you know, what good would have getting under our desks have done if, if God forbid, a nuclear weapon had hit uh, Texas where I grew up? Um, so, it, you know, the kind of planning we did wasn't very serious, but at least it was something that we did uh, as a community. And I think, um, you know, we're going to have to rebuild with our publics this sense of being prepared and taking care of, uh, taking care of ourselves. And I think the plan that you all have to 
um, distribute pamphlets to your entire population that lay out some of the tasks and expectations that the government has for them is a good starting point, but I think it's going to be a very long road to develop that culture of preparedness. Um, and, and indicative of that, our emergency management agency here in the United States, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which we call FEMA, has just come out with a new strategic plan that has three pillars, and one of the, the, the first pillar is developing a culture of preparedness here in the United States. And I think FEMA is realizing, again, coming out of a difficult hurricane season in particular, that we still have not figured out how to convince our publics to take care of themselves. Uh, and I'm, I'm guilty of that myself, frankly. I, you know, I've grown up in sort of the homeland security, national security community. I, I ought to know better, but in all honesty, you know, I don't have, I live in a part of the country that has hurricanes, but I don't have what we call a go bag in my, in the trunk of my car, for example. I certainly don't have a week's worth of uh, bottled water and dried foods to take care of my family. Um, and I'm someone who should know better. So, I'm, you know, shame on me. But it's just indicative, I think, of the challenge that we faced in terms of persuading our publics. But um, one of the things that FEMA is doing to try to overcome this challenge is they've started a very active social media campaign. And they are doing something called prep talks, which is a play on TED Talks, to try to reach out to a broader public and start you know, really trying energetically to communicate to Americans why they need to be prepared. Uh, and I think, you know, that's something maybe that Sweden could think about doing, you know, trying to be creative about ways to reach out to your publics. Uh, I noticed another important theme or set of recommendations in the report is focused on making some organizational changes to, to help build this civil defense approach. And I think in particular, the Commission's recommendation to make sure that there's a single government agency responsible for civil defense and responsible for the planning is a very smart decision. Um, you all may remember when we experienced Hurricane Katrina in 2005, uh, that, that really revealed, frankly, the depth of challenges that we here in the United States faced in terms of dealing with the catastrophic event. Uh, and one of the major reasons why our response was not very effective um, and frankly was an embarrassment um, for, for most Americans, I think, was, was the fact that we did not have clarity about roles and responsibilities among among the different federal agencies that had response missions, but also the relationship between the federal government agencies and then the state and local authorities. So I think the recommendations the commission has to want to make sure that you have clarity around that it, are very smart. And similarly, the recommendations focused on creating some geographic uh, sort of regional civil defense areas with a single individual in charge is also very smart. I think those are, again, we, ha we here in the United States have 10 emergency, we have 10 FEMA regions, and um, we have a, a regional administrator for each one of those 10 regions around the country, and we've done quite a bit of work to make sure that there are actually um, assistance relationships between the FEMA regions and among the states so that our governors can share assets and resources uh, much more effectively than, than we used to. And we've gotten very good now at, at uh, using those mechanisms. I also was struck looking at the, at the commission's reports that one of the challenges, and, and again, the chairman highlighted this in his presentation, is um, the new context in which Sweden will be undertaking this civil defense concept. And what I mean by that is that um, decades ago, you know, it was, it was a different world. We hadn't had the information revolution. We didn't have the internet. Globalization hadn't really come. The, the, the national government had much more control over a variety of different infrastructures. Now you have, uh, in addition to you know, the much more 24-7 um, social media context, you have presumably many more foreign companies operating in Sweden. You have um, less governmental control over probably important pieces of infrastructure. And so creating civil defense plans in that context where there are many more stakeholders and participants uh, in the picture, if you will, is going to be 
uh, a complex undertaking, and I think Sweden will be breaking new ground in that area, and it will be useful for us in the United States to, to learn from you all as you go about that process. That, that also brings me, I think, to a very important piece uh, that the Commission touches on, which is um, the role of the private sector in civil defense and how you all are going to interact with your private sector in Sweden. I think the Commission's idea of a national business council around civil defense is a terrific one. Um, the private sector can be an incredible source of obviously resources, but also innovation and creativity. And I think having a formal organization that allows you, your government, to have a mechanism to reach out to your private industries is a very smart move and frankly something that, that we may well want to look at. We certainly have many different ways to interact with the private sector here in, here in the U.S. We have the Chamber of Commerce, there are a variety of different trade associations, but to my knowledge, we don't have a business council specifically designed around emergency management. So I think that's a very interesting idea. And that also, in my mind, sparked the thought of at the, at the Resilience Center at the Atlanta Council, we have found that organizations or systems that are resilient tend to have some common characteristics. And one of those common characteristics is um, systems that, that allow a high degree of participation and bring in a large number of stakeholders tend to be more resilient. And I think um, having things like a National Business Council will allow you all to, again, bring in more stakeholders into your planning process and, and raise the resiliency of your overall effort. Another trait that we find in very resilient organizations is kind of a fancy term, uh, polycentric governance. But what it really means is organizations that can interact effectively with multiple levels and types of governance structures tend to function more effectively in crises than those that, that can only sort of communicate vertically or you know can sort of go up or down but can't go out and can't be sort of networked. So I think thinking as you all undertake this important work, thinking about how you can have a set of structures that allow um, relationships and participation at a variety of different levels will be something that will again help you be more uh, resilient overall. I just thought I would finish up by, by offering um, again how important it is that I think the Commission has undertaken this work and how prudent you all are in, a, in the recommendations you put forward. You know, we're living in, in a very challenging time and there's a lot of uncertainty in the international community. I was struck uh, looking at the various discussions that took place in Munich last week at, at how much uncertainty there is and how much fragility there seems to be in the liberal world order right now. Um, so I think it's it's a good time to be questioning what we've been doing and thinking about new ways to be prepared. And I know there's been a, an increasing level of discussion in Sweden about the issue of NATO membership. And while NATO obviously has already a very close relationship with Sweden, uh, with Sweden and Finland, it's really the closest relationship outside of the alliance uh, that we have. And I think the, the recent decision to extend host nation support uh, to NATO is a very smart one as well. But I would note, as someone, again, coming out of our national security establishment here, that um, partnership is not the same thing as membership. And, and going back to something I said at the outset, I have been struck uh, in war games, for example, that I've participated in since leaving government at how slow sometimes our decision making seems to be, even in the context, frankly, of the NATO alliance, and uh, even in games I've been a part of where we're, a nation has invoked Article 5 and, and we're, we're playing out a scenario where the alliance as a whole is determining how to act. Um, so, you know, and again, I think in a crisis situation where the stakes are very high, but there may be a lot of uncertainty and murkiness, uh, it's, it's going to take time for NATO to figure out how to act, and that's just, you know, amongst the alliance itself, not to mention coming to the aid of countries that are outside of the alliance. And certainly Sweden has its own conditions, and you all are best placed to understand what makes the most sense for you all. Um, and to decide what is the best path forward for you all. But I think that's why, as you all have that discussion as a country, 
it's very smart, I think, to do the kind of prudent planning and to make the assumption that it may be quite a while before the international community can come to your assistance. I think it's very good to not make assumptions that might not bear out in a crisis. So I applaud the Commission for sort of bringing very practical uh, recommendations forward. Thank you. Thanks to both um, uh, Bjorn and Christine. We're, we're about to launch into to Q&A uh, that I'm eager to get to. Um, but I don't want to let the, uh, the commission off the hook just yet. We've, um, our, our Swedish friends have, have traveled uh, far to be here, and, and, uh, and the commission consists of the distinguished parliamentarians from, from across the spectrum. So, so I do want to give, um, uh, uh, give members of the commission a chance to perhaps add a, a, a perspective um, um, or two, uh, both on the report but also on the, on the discussion. So just sort of scanning and see if we have a volunteer. Yes, Karen Enstrom, um, a member of parliament from the moderate party. Please, come on up. You're on stage. <laughs> I'm on stage. Thank you so much, and thank you all for for join, joining us today, and thank you for the comments on our report. Um, as a representative from the largest opposition party in the parliament, the moderate party, that's a centre-right party, uh, I just would like to start to underline the importance uh, of having a broad political support for, for this report. And I must say that we have been working together closely, trying to find this broad support, and I'm, I'm very happy for that. That really lays the good foundation for, for the work that we have to continue with. I would like to just make two points. Um, during our work with this report, we have met many representatives from different organizations, agencies, municipalities, and uh, I would say all of them have been very engaged, uh, quite, I think, um, also um, not just interested, but also they have been expecting a lot from us. Uh, but they have been very clear on that they need some guidelines. They want to do the right thing, but how to start and what to plan for or against. And I hope, uh, we hope that this report has at least given a starting point from, for them where to go, how to think, what kind of conflict or what kind of crisis and uh, also this, um, these timelines give some kind of guidelines for, for all kinds of organizations, agencies and municipalities for. So what, which kind of requirement, what do we demand from different actors? And Secondly, just to be very, very clear, this report is, of course, uh, well, I think we are content and satisfied with the, the conclusions and the recommendations, uh, but we are only in the beginning of our work. This is a platform, but the real work starts now. And we have to involve all the actors, uh, and I'm glad that you pointed out, uh, underlined the importance of the private sector, because we cannot just do this with the public sector. We need uh, participation from everybody, and that sounds maybe a little bit uh, naive, but to, to have a, a good, uh, not just resilience, but also readiness and preparedness, we need all the actors to really dig into this hard work. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I think we have about 30 minutes or so, or a bit more for um, for Q and A. Um, I'm going to launch off with uh, um, with a question or two on my own, and then and then leave it open to um, uh, to the audience. Um, Bjorn, let's let's start with you. Um, so war in Europe was really unthinkable just a few years ago, but but here we are, um, and you have a uh, you have a report uh, report with. Um, a sometimes dire message about that Swedes need to get used to thinking about crisis, to prepare for war, uh, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and, and perhaps um, exist under a period of time in, in, in stressful situations. Um, how is the public in Sweden reacting to this message, and, and um, are, are, are they receptive to, to some of these conclusions? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that question. Of course, it's very vital. And when we presented this a few days before Christmas, we found in traditional media, rather, I would say, m almost everywhere, 
a, a, a narrative like you said, only 20 years ago it was completely different. Now we have to adopt to the new challenge, the return to our instability in our part of the world. And on social media, where everything can go, it was also interesting to note if, if my, my, my staff told me that looking at it from uh, the an helicopter view, yes, the basic attitudes were positive also on social media. And um, the uh, spokespeople for various organizations, we had an annual meeting in the mountains in January, middle of January, and as a matter of fact, when the whole commission introduced the concrete proposals, there was no one arguing against and no one really criticizing anything. And I would add, I, I had some worries that the, the Swedish culture of climate since many decades is a climate where you make fun of things that you dislike. You, you don't necessarily take a uh, clear, uh, aggressive standpoint against, but you ridiculize what you think is unwise or, or out, of the, out of the realistic situation. So I was afraid in some instances that that would occur, that our, some of our at least national famous humorists will take use of our presentation. But that has not been the case. I have seen nothing on ridiculizing our, our uh, report. So in that sense, I think that there is an except, uh, a, a sentiment that you feel somewhat safer when you know that we take on here instead of feeling uh, uh, more unsafe because we are disclosing realities. Thank you. Um, and, and then, Christine, really sort of the same question, but from a U.S. perspective. Do you think there is, um, um, and you, you touched upon some of the uh, um, some of the challenges that we have faced in terms of natural disasters and uh, uh, false alarms regarding nuclear attacks. Um, do you think there's a growing recognition in the, um, among the American public that we need to do some of these things and um, fix systems and improve resilience? And is there, is there is there a growing American recognition of that of that challenge outside of Washington? You know, I think uh, the American public is a little bit schizophrenic. I mean, maybe that's the right word. I, I think there is a, a realization, a recognition by most Americans that we need to be prepared. Um, but what we lack is follow through. And it's a little bit like what I fear, and I'll, I'll show my uh, little p political stripes here. You know, I have, I have t twin teenage daughters who are juniors in high school, and their school yesterday did a walkout in support of the teenagers, you know, and who are marching in Florida, for example, to try to seek gun control. And, um, you know, I, I, I see some similarities there in that, you know, on the gun control issue, we're at a moment in time where there's been an event that has really galvanized people. And, you know, you see sort of a, a huge and sort of new character of um, people wanting to see change. My fear is six months from now, particularly again, knowing teenagers, you know, will they still be focused on this issue? And when they, will they still be, you know, when they turn 18, will they be voting? And it's a little bit like that. I think, I think when Americans, you know, this fall, when we saw the hurricanes that happened in Florida and Texas and the terrible hurricane in Puerto Rico, that makes people think, oh, I should be prepared. I should do some things. I should, you know, make sure I have a first aid kit and what have you. Um, but then in the press of daily life and events, you move on and you forget. Um, so I think the challenge for both Sweden and the United States is how do you take that sort of intellectual recognition of what is needed and translate it into actual practical activity? Um, and I think, you know, there are, there are ways, it seems to me now, to be able to do that more effectively um, you know, in the in the days of sort of Amazon, where you can get practically anything you want online, we need to probably emphasize to our publics that putting together, you know, a, a preparedness package, if you will, 
doesn't require five years ago. You know, five years ago, you would have had to go to 10 different stores to get the duct tape and the plastic and the first aid kits and all those things. Now you can just order it online. So, you know, you can do, we should be able to do this in 10 minutes. And I think, you know, making it as easy as possible for our citizens to take those steps is, is the piece that we need to really work on. That's my, that's my view. All right, now we want to involve um, all of you all. So let's, let's live by, by three simple rules. Um, first, state your name and affiliation before asking a question. Um, wait for the mic. I see we have mic runners here. Uh, and then last, um, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, make sure it's a question uh, rather than just a statement. So, uh, so please. Yes, here uh, to my left. Thank you very much. My name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm a colonel in the US military. I'm here today in my private capacity. Um, and I am curious as to how the Swedish, uh, Mr. Chairman, how the Swedish feminist foreign policy um, informs the uh, total defense concept. Talk so much. Right now, the, the, uh, the report is on 2021 to 2025. And me being the chair, I'm strict about that. But my colleagues in the commission represent eight political parties, including myself. I'm a social democrat. They have different p options now. Some of the, for instance, two of them are in government. One of them is supporting government in budgets. Uh, two of the other in the opposition are uh, implementing. Uh, supporting government and implementing the ongoing strategy, and some of the parties are opposition in traditional ways. I mean, they have all various means in order to alert the government and indirectly also other authorities of how implementing stepwise, uh, previous than, than the formal report. That is up for parliamentary um, individual, uh, the parties can choose ways of coming, bringing these issues more rapid or less rapid uh, to occur. That is the situation. But I have found also that speaking with people in the country, I, I, for instance, I was seated last Friday with a lady who is deputy chair in one of our big hospitals in the western part. I, she has said, I read about this. What can, what's, what's going to happen? And I told him about the same as I tell you. That, but I also said, but you being a responsible uh, representative, you can also initiate uh, in your board preparations. You can start immediately, bring it up in your board and tell them that this hospital has to find a policy that facilitates a turnover in case of uh, that um, we have large uh, numbers of, of uh, people in serious uh, trauma conditions and so on. And we'll see what happened. And I also met others who feel that they can bring up, they have got the ideas in the report, they have a um, political or civil citizen responsibility to bring up things. So that's the thing. I'll go. Uh, it will be a we are, of course, a top-bottom report, but it seems that the, there will be a bottom-up um, process now. All right, um, all the way in the back, behind, uh, behind you there. Yeah, there, uh, by, the coffee, by the coffee stand. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, Melissa Hirsch, Strategy and Risk Consultant and Research Associate with ASU Center for Emergency Management and Homeland Security. So I think, Bjorn, this is for you mostly in the commission. Under Sweden's concept of total defense, events that are characterized as hybrid in nature, but not yet attributed because the forensics haven't been done, how is the response authority determined in the moment when response is actually required? Let's say it's against critical infrastructure, but not against military assets. Um, we, are, we believe that our legislation is basically sound for also these uh, events. And we were told by a briefing last week that, you know, we had a terrorist attack a year ago in the center of Stockholm. And the uh, equipment is right now in court, and uh, so the proceedings have started. We were told the other week from the military side that when this event occurred, 
only a few minutes thereafter, the um, headquarter, the military headquarter, was in contact with the police headquarter in order to follow minute by minute what were the signs. Was it a single event performed by, as it turned out, a, this man, or was this a part of an operation that had other parts as well, for instance, of military um, c c uh, conditioning that says that if, when the uh, civil authorities are completely focused on this uh, terrorism, there can be man uh, attacks cyber attacks or physical attacks that have to be can be classified as military threats so they are very keen or exercised and have that kind of all deep minute to minute to find out under which legal room will the community's counter action take Before before we go on, actually, um, Christine, if I, if I can ask you to sort of perhaps compare and contrast a little bit, sort of from a U.S. perspective, in terms of we've also had a live discussion here about military support to civilian authorities and um, and and so forth. Um, how do we think our way through who who does what in a crisis that that's in a gray zone and and um, um, and who who has the lead on on response? Well, here, I mean, we're we're very grounded, and I, I don't know, I don't think this is always necessary really particularly well understood, and I think what happened in Puerto Rico was a good example of that. In the United States, fundamentally, the state government is in the lead, the state and local community, and the federal government comes in in support uh, in a response situation. So, um, you know, in many cases, we work very closely together, and again, we, we learned many important lessons in the wake of Hurricane Katrina about how to do that more effectively, because where it gets challenging is where a state government is essentially overwhelmed by the situation, whatever the situation might be. Um, but, and that was certainly the case, for example, in Puerto Rico, which is, you know, a, a territory of the United States. The, the state or the territorial government there, if you will, was essentially overwhelmed. Um, and the federal government had to come in and really provide, you know, a very substantial level of assistance. But, but the legal framework here in the United States is very much based on state governors are in charge and they, they place requests to the federal government through FEMA through, and on the DOD side, it's through what we call defense coordinating officials. We have a, a DCO in each of the uh, FEMA regions that is a, then they are essentially liaisons to help, to help uh, the Department of Defense understand what the requirements are at the state level that are most needed. So that's sort of how we work on it. But I do think the cyber challenges, you know, are a new area and, um, and, and again, I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges uh, for Sweden and the United States, and that's another area where I think we in the U.S. have the opportunity to learn from the Swedish experience and to cooperate together as we all sort through uh, how do we deal with which agencies have the lead, how does the private sector, which frankly in many cases owns a lot of the infrastructure that could be attacked via cyber means, um, and what are the legal authorities and what can be done even as at the national level we may be working through attribution. Those, those are newer areas. Um, and I was in government when we had the North Korean attacks on Sony and I saw firsthand how the challenges from a policy perspective of how do we work through that. It, it was sort of terra incognita at that point. Steve Lanning there on, on, on our left. Thank you. Hi, uh, Steve Flanagan from Rand Corporation. Uh, I have a question uh, really directed to uh, Jim and Von Saito mainly, but I'd be interested in Christine's perspectives on this as well. You noted the importance of uh, enhancing, or the Commission concluded the need to enhance linkages between NATO and the EU as well as other countries in the region, uh, and also uh, better uh, integration of civil and, and military authorities in dealing with crisis management. I wondered uh, if you could, if we could draw you out a little bit about what were some of the key shortcomings you found in particularly the linkages between NATO and EU crisis assessment uh, and, and response efforts uh, and how Sweden is linked into those and, uh, and also whether you made any specific recommendations about, uh, about how those could be best improved. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think most of you are aware of the situation found out in Germany, especially, that the, the logistics of transporting, for instance, U.S. heavy brigades crossing Germany is very difficult from a legal point of view, since the Bundesrepublik, for, with various reasons, have re regulated transports in a way that is very difficult to, to make a rapid, um, thorough uh, transport through Germany. We, that was disclosed to us when we visited Brussels last spring, and we were told that the uh, staffers in NATO and uh, EU respectively, and of course Germany, were working on this. And um, I don't know the situation right now, but it seems that the NATO planning targets to a large extent are related to on civil authorities to perform. It's difficult for NATO or defense ministries to order these civilian uh, authorities to take, take up the, the uh, NATO uh, conclusions. And the EU, to us, seem to try to uh, not complicate things further on, but using the NATO TARG-7, I think they were targets. But um, it's, uh, one cannot uh, avoid the conclusion that these to these, the international obligations of the two organizations co can complicate the issue for an individual member state. And we are aware of that, and we have, we have not made all our questions to the European Union f for next, when we are going to discuss the military components in the defense. That we have to do. Uh, what will happen with the internal market in case of a one membership is in, in a war situation. Will the, w the overall internal market, will it still work? I mean, cro uh, crossing the borders of humans, capital, goods, etc. Will that work function? And there is no clear-cut answer from the EU part on that side. However, it seems to me that they understand each other uh, in Brussels. Any others? Please, here on the, here in the third row. Good morning, Sanjin Choi, Langham Partners. Can I follow up um, what Ms. Uh, Christine Worman said about partnership is not the same as a membership. But, but you mentioned about a uh, little bit touch up on the um, issues about NATO membership. So could you able to tell me, A, what is the current status of the Swedish parliamentarians' views on host nations? And because my understanding is as your party is not quite keen on it. And B, what are the current status of uh, Swedish parliamentarians' views, a party's views on NATO membership? Because current government, uh, Social Democrats, Greens, rely on the left and the Democrat parties, which is opposing it. So I would be interested in your views and upcoming election result as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and um, the situation is that the two parties in government, Social Democrats and the Green, are not favoring membership. Uh, the same goes with the left party who uh, is involved basically in, on budgets uh, with the government. And uh, the Swedish Democrats, which uh, were introduced to parliament in 2010, and is a party with about uh, 13, 14, 15 percent of the ele uh, votes due to the service, uh, service, are also disfavoring membership. The previous gov four party government, then under pre Premier Mr. Reinfeldt, the four parties there, they all favor me membership. And that has also been added as, um, uh, it to the report as minority, uh, minority. Uh, in sayings in, to the report. That is the situation. And uh, I would like to add, however, that my own view is that, and we have discussed that fairly much also, that whatever will be the view of the individual party on the membership question, pro or con, the Swedish uh, defense planning must basically have its uh, own pre <coughs> Uh, may be made on its own premises. 
So therefore, I, I don't think that this uh, splittering question will necessarily lead to differences when it comes to our upcoming proposals on military defense. But just as a, as a point of clarification, it's about um, um, Sweden's partnership with NATO and the Hope's Nation Support Agreement, um, as I understand, there's, there's broad parliamentary agreement around those, around those two components of partnership. Yes, if I c think uh, there were votes against it in, in, the, in Parliament, but there was a substantial majority in favor of it. I look upon my colleagues and they seem to give me, the right, give me an accept. That was understood by me rightly. So thank you, Magnus, for bringing this into clarity as well. Um, I thought I saw, please, uh, the left flank is really active today. <laughs> Nothing from the right. Sure, Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. I wonder if you can talk about the price or cost of this. I, I recognize that this report is just the start of a process, but is there a substantial cost that will have to be borne by the public? Uh, or do you provide incentives from a government standpoint, and does this compete with more traditional national security spending for the armed forces? Thank you for the question. Yes, there is a bill upon it, and it's a, around um, four bil uh, billion Swedish krona. That is uh, about uh, two billion U.S. dollars. Is that correct? Five hundred. Yeah, five hundred. And um, it has to be uh, has to be in balanced with the upcoming report on military defense, and um, the Minister of Finance wants all in all our estimates to be finally balanced between each other. And um, that was to some extent the case or during the Cold War. The civil defense components, if I remember rightly, they were around 10, 12, 14 percent of the total defense. Um, if that will be the consequence now, it's difficult for me to say. But you are right that you have to b b have them viewed as in one hat. And I would add, however, that we also argue that a well-developed total defense, including its civil components, it is also to be understood as a deterrent to an aggressor. An aggressor must take uh, note of for instance, the discussion here, when I refer to that, yes, our report was widely accepted in Sweden. There was no really arguing against it. So the potential uh, aggressor must understand that when it is going to, when it is implemented, the threshold will be higher for the aggressor to to uh, when. They make their planning for the, the military resources, the political costs, and so on, or in financial strains, etc., etc. So one must not only view civil defense in a humanitarian view, one must also look upon it as a part of fundamentals. Um, thank you. So, um, before we move on, just create, again in this sort of compare and contrast um, um, approach, and, and obviously we here don't have an equivalent Defense Commission report and, and so on and so forth, but by thinking, thinking about resilience more broadly, um, what should that cost? Um, and is that, a, is that a cost that should be borne by taxpayers alone, or is it an element where, where, we, uh, where we also get uh, the private sector to pick up some of these things? I mean, so how, do you, how do you think about um, the costs that are imposed to make, make a society resilient, either for civilian crisis or, or, um, or a military crisis? I think the way I would try to frame it uh, here in the United States, but I think it's equally applicable to Sweden, is the sort of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and investments in resilient, uh, investments in activities that build resilience, you know, whether it's in the civil defense concept, context or in other contexts, um, are, are good investments because they lower the costs of recovery um, on on the back end of events, and if you're if you're able to sort of build in resilience up front, again, it saves you money. I think down the road in terms of the cleanup, if you will, that you have to do 
when something bad happens. I mean, we've that's very much, I think, the case we've been trying to make, for example, um, you know, there's been quite a bit of talk here in the United States about the need to reinvest in our infrastructure, roads, airports, bridges, what have you. Uh, the Trump administration has recently come out with a proposal for how to do that. And part of what we've been trying to infuse into that conversation is as, as municipalities start thinking about how to rebuild bridges, how to redo airports, um, think about making investments that take into account severe weather issues, that take into account climate change, because um, th that is inevitable. And you know, making investments now so that infrastructure we build is able to take that into account um, is the smart way to go about it. And I think it's equally, it's the same kind of idea in the civil defense context. You know, I think of it also as um, Secretary Mattis is, has, you know, was quoted a couple of years ago before he became the secretary as saying that, um, you know, if, if we don't invest in the State Department and in our diplomats, then that means he has to buy more ammunition. It's sort of the same idea. Finally, the right wakes up. Or at least my right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mary Nippert. I'm the Honorary Consul of Estonia. And I was wondering, with regards to you, um, the defense talking about international cooperations, there's repeated uh, mention of um, cooperations with Finland and Norway. But what about, especially going back to basically the in for a penny, in for a pound, what about cooperations with the Baltics and Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania? Thank you very much. And um, as a matter of fact, myself and the uh, Secretary General of the Commission, we were to Tallinn uh, two weeks, uh, three weeks ago, and m I made about the same briefing in the presence of the Defense Minister, an, an old colleague of mine. And um, we are definitely interested in uh, further elaborating the collaboration and also encouraging es Estonia, Latvia, and La Lithuania to collaborate more between themselves on these matters. And uh, so we, it ended up into that we will take further, we will recommend. I, we, we are, the commission is not an executive, um, but our counterparts in Estonia were executive politicians and higher officials, that yes, we are open for initiatives in this, in this area. <laughs> Um, I think we have time for one or two more before we before we close out. Any willing volunteers? All right. Well, let me let me end with a question then to um, uh, to Christina. And it goes on this on this on this cooperation theme um, that that obviously, and I think it's been highlighted already, um, that Sweden is is growing its defense relationship with with the United States uh, in um, in exercises in. Uh, uh, in presses, in planning, and and um, and so on. Um, but looking at this total defense concept, um, uh, from your perspective, um, as a former senior DoD official, um, um, anything that stands out to you as as, as particular areas where where there could be fruitful cooperation between the United States and Sweden? I think the area that actually stands out to me the most. I, I mean, I, you know, there, there's already um, excellent dialogues that go on between Sweden and the Department of Defense. Uh, and, and I think you know we'll we'll want to make sure that that conversation stays invigorated as we think about sort of cri potential crises scenarios. Um, but the area I see for potentially really fruitful cooperation is in the area of cybersecurity and thinking about how do we secure our infrastructure, um, Swedish and the United States. How do we secure that infrastructure against cyber attacks? How do we secure our military networks? How do we plan to be able to communicate and exercise command and control in the event that potentially um, our communication systems are taken down by a cyber attack? You know, I think there's much to be learned in terms of um, which, which agencies, again, have the lead, who has responsibility for protecting civilian infrastructure versus military infrastructure. These are a lot of issues that are still uh, being, you know, thought through, certainly in our, um, in our military. And I think, you know, the commission report highlighted the importance of the cyber aspect of the civil defense. And I think that's something where we could really uh, learn a lot and cooperate fruitfully together. 
Great. So with that, I think that's a, um, I think that's pretty much a wrap and all the remains are the, the thank you. So first, a thank you to, um, to our speakers. I thank you to the audience and for, for the, for the great questions. Good to see so many folks come out for this. Uh, um, and obviously a huge thank you to, uh, to the House of Sweden, the Swedish Embassy for, um, uh, for hosting. So, uh, thanks all around. Farewell and see you next time.